Welcome, everybody. This is Harvard Medical School's Ethics in Research and Biotechnology Monthly Consortium Series. I'm your host, In Siu Hian. I'm the Director of Research Ethics and a faculty member in the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. I'm also a Professor of Bioethics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. This monthly consortium explores issues at the intersection of ethics, technology, and bioscience with an eye toward practical and ethically responsible approaches and policies. Um, just a quick reminder, next month on November uh, 20th, we have Madeline Lancaster from Cambridge, UK, and she'll be joining us to talk about how human brain organoids can help advance COVID-19 research. So again, that's next month, November 20th. Now I'd like to turn our attention to today's session, which is with Lorenz Studer. Lorenz Studer is the director of the Center for Stem Cell Biology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. He's a pioneer in stem cell-based approaches to Parkinson's disease and other diseases of the central nervous system. In 2015, he received the MacArthur Genius Grant Award for much of the work that he'll be presenting today. So I'd like to, at this point, turn it over to Dr. Studer. We're going to present uh, for about an hour, i uh, go through a slide deck. I'll be interjecting here and there with some questions and some comments. And then we'll have 30 minutes at the end for a Q&A. So the instructions for Q&A are up here on the board. You simply type into the Q&A feature your questions, and we'll get to those as many as we can at the conclusion of the formal presentation. If there are any technical issues, you can use the chat function, send a message to the panelists and the staff members. OK, so with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Studer. Thanks so much for this uh, great introduction, Enzo. I really look forward to uh, talk to you about uh, my work and we'll share the presentation, just make sure. So I hope you can all see that now. Yes. Otherwise, let me know. So what I really would like to do is to tell you a little bit about the journey or, or actually nearly two decades on how we went from the idea of developing cell therapies for Parkinson's disease to actual uh, implementation to do so. Obviously, still at the early stages, but I think the journey might be helpful to give an idea of some of the challenges, both on the scientific side, but also obviously the challenges that come up, thinking about problems uh, that maybe intersect with ethics and research regulation and so forth. And I look very much forward to the dialogue within this presentation and to all your subsequent questions you might have. So just uh, to start off, I want to give you a little bit of a background about Parkinson's disease so we are all on the same page. So Parkinson's disease was first described, as you could imagine, by James Parkinson's actually many, many years back. He was basically walking through the streets of London and noticed that there were patients that have very unusual gait and actually astutely described some of their symptoms. Now, the more scientific description of the disease came really from Jean-Martin Charcot, and he particularly noticed the very, very stereotypic features that these patients have with regard to movement problems. And for example, here, if you can see my cursor, you see these different squibbles that he recorded, where in one case, that's actually a shaking that you have when you have a problem in the brain that affects the so-called cerebellum, it has nothing to do with Parkinson's, but below here, you can see specifically the shaking or tremor in the Parkinson's patients. He already also described how these patients have this peculiar gait and, and, and position changes, how when they write, they write smaller and smaller, which is another feature of the disease. And these are sim still some of the main symptoms, obviously, that we use today to actually diagnose the disease. And so primarily, Parkinson's disease is considered the movement disorders. And the movement disorder component of the disease is caused by the loss of a very specific cell type. And that cell type uh, is called dopamine neurons or dopamine nerve cells. And they are a relatively rare cell type in the brain. So you have only about 300,000 of those on each side of your brain. You can say 300,000 is a lot, but actually, if you think that in the brain, you have about 100 billion of those neurons. It's a very, very small fraction. And so it's maybe more a little bit of a, we can think of it as a Lego piece, no, that's missing in a bigger structure. And once those cells die off, once the Lego piece is missing, about 50% are needed to be missing, you get the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Now here it's important to mention that Parkinson's is not exclusively just affecting movement. 
It's also known that you get the so-called non-dopamine symptoms. For example, one of the earliest symptoms often is that patients, before they even know they have those symptoms, on the movement side, they lose sense of smell, or they often complain about constipation and other issues. And that's often kind of the, the, the one kind of reassuring thing. If you have a good sense of smell, not only do you not so much need to worry about COVID, which is a whole other issue, and the lose of smell, but actually also in Parkinson's, that's often happening early, but that is obviously chronic. And so if you have a very good smell, the chances that you develop Parkinson's in the next five years is actually relatively small. Now, there is also important to understand that there is uh, basically a better understanding of the genetics of the disease. So in most cases, we actually don't have a specific gene that's responsible for the disease. But in rare populations, we have by now identified about 20 different genes that can predispose patients to Parkinson's disease. And if you then look at the cell biology side, you kind of get some kind of an idea of what might go wrong in these cells. For example, one part in the cell that's affected is the mitochondria, which is like the energy factory. That's probably the case because these cells are not only kind of rare, I told you it's only 300,000 out of 100 billion, but it turns out they are giant. So it turns out one cell, one dopamine neuron, if you add up all the processes, is several yards of length, so several meters of length. And each cell makes about two to 10 million connections in another cell. So they're kind of monsters in cells. And therefore they need to really have a very high energy metabolism, which maybe makes them vulnerable to disease. <coughs> Sorry. In addition, they also need to clear up all the proteins they generate in such a long cell, which is again, the cleaning system that might also go wrong. So there are all kinds of ideas about what could go wrong, but the, Truth of the matter is, so far there is no new therapy available for patients since the original idea of replacing just simply the dopamine that the cells produce. So kind of this fact that we, despite all the scientific knowledge, we still have no satisfactory therapy brought kind of the provocative idea, which really gets us to the stem cells. So the idea is if you don't really know how to fix it, you don't know exactly how to stop the process, why don't you just simply replace what's missing? And again, you can compare it to like if you use your your iPhone and it breaks, nearly no one ever tries to kind of bother exactly why it broke or whatever, you just get a new one. And so that's kind of the simplistic idea. Maybe we can just put new nerve cells in, a couple of hundred thousand doing the job. Now, before we got to the, the stem cells, there are obviously already currently uh, useful therapies. And I mentioned one of them, that was a revolution about 60 years ago, led to the Nobel Prize for that finding, which is basically just simply giving the patient the dopamine that's produced by those cells. So this is actually a highly effective approach. At the beginning of the disease, it feels like, like, a, like a cure for a couple of years, but then what actually happens is as the cells continue to die off, not only 50%, more and more and more, eventually that, that uh, drug you give, which is actually the precursor of the dopamine, still needs to be converted into dopamine in the brain. You lose the cells, becomes less and less effective and becomes a real problem. So one approved treatment for that is that you can put a stimulator in the brain called DBS. And for some patients that has quite dramatic improvements uh, after the DBS. So when you install this electric stimulator, you switch it on. For example, the shaking that I showed in this movie before sometimes just simply stops within seconds. So it's very dramatic. However, that approach also doesn't really work for many of the other symptoms very well. And it has complications. And for example, patients often complain of certain side effects that they have more problems in speaking in a very precise manner. So it gets speak dysarthria, it's called. And there are other problems associated with that that makes it not an ideal therapy for all the people. So that brings us then again closer to where, where the whole lecture is about, which is the newest experimental therapy, either gene therapy, which again, people try to Amazing, make kind of a fake dopamine cell. The dopamine is cell, but maybe you can force another cell with a bunch of genes to behave like a dopamine cell. Or finally, you put actual dopamine neurons back. And so that's the question. So can you do that? Can you put in a brain? Now, a brain is such a complicated structure. Can you integrate new nerve cells? So this actually has been tried and has been tried already for a couple of decades, which is kind of the past as contrast to what you want to do currently or in the future. So it's basically the work using fetal cells. I'm going to spend a bit more time on that in a few minutes. But there were studies that showed that you can just simply isolate from a human fetus from elective abortions, typically six to 10 weeks of age, 
you can dissect out the region of the midbrain, shown here in, in this cartoon. You dissociate the cell and inject them into the brain. And if you inject them in the right place, what actually happens is you can stave off the continuous loss of dopamine, which is shown here by this imaging procedure that labels dopamine function or dopamine release. You see on that one side, the patient starts losing dopamine, but then actually uh, looks like uh, in this case, you, this can be staved off the continuous uh, loss and actually you get even increased dopamine levels. So that was kind of exciting. And it's also exciting that at least a subset of the patients, and we have to say it's a small subset that we know about, seem to have a remarkable effect. So these are patients that are now 15 years after they got that procedure, and they are off this L-DOPA medication. That's very, very unusual because you have a progressive disease that gets worse and worse. And in this case, they seem to be not needing the medication at all. But obviously fetal tissue, despite again, having started those studies in the late 80s, has never really completely taken off due to some of the ethical and logistical issues. And again, that's something I'm gonna go back to in a minute, but just as a contrast, what I'm gonna focus on today, obviously primarily, is using stem cells. And then we have to be very careful what I mean by stem cells, because stem cells is a kind of a catch-all word for all kinds of stem cells. So what we think is particularly promising and at the verge of translation are so-called pluripotent stem cells that are either embryonic stem cells. So these are cells that are harvested from IVF type embryos. So when a couple that wants to have a pregnancy via IVF and they have the child, they are happy they don't have additional children. So usually they have leftover embryos and those are used for isolating embryonic stem cells. And that's again a very, very early stage of development shown here by the tip of the needle. This very, very small structure is called a blastocyst, about five to six days of human development. Very different from fetal tissue, very early embryonic stage. Now the other equally uh, promising source are adult derived IPS cells. That's again, another Nobel prize winning technology where you can now take any, pretty much any cell type of your body. Most it's taken blood or skin, but actually you can, for example, even take urine. You can isolate epithelial from urine, put these genes in, convert them, and you get stem cells that seem to be largely indistinguishable from the cells you can derive from those embryonic cells. And then those cells, because it's such an early stage of development, we want to guide them down to make, for example, dopamine neurons. And that's again a, a, an area that I'm going to go into, obviously, in a minute in much more detail. Lorenz, I have a few questions. Um, yeah. So the the graphic on the left represents the past work using fetal cells. And I know mm -hmm. most of that work was done in Sweden many, many years ago. Um, now, when you make your own dop dopamine cells from stem cell lines, do you feel and did you have to do a lot of um, testing to make sure that there were equivalent to the fetal source tissue. So does your work require yeah, uh, comparison yeah. well, with fetal cells? That's a very good question. Our personal work actually does not, but as a community in the field, these experiments have been done side by side. Mm -hmm. So for example, what you can do is you can inject those cells into an animal model of Parkinson's disease and see how many cells do you need to rescue the animals. You have the potency per cell. And so there will be comparison studies were done where you make the same, presumably, or a very similar cell from the stem cells. You put them in and you do a comparability. And that actually for us was very important, those studies to guide our own dosing, because it's not perfectly one-to-one. -one. It's very similar, mm -hmm. but it's not exactly the same. But obviously here, here in the US, it's actually relatively tricky now to get mm -hmm. the, the, the fetal tissue for doing those studies, because at least early we had a lot of NIH funding for developing this work and so forth. And so we are in a way fortunate again that we had our colleagues in Sweden, particularly who did those comparisons and obviously had a lot of experience with fetal tissue. Even so my own experience, uh, I've also quite a bit of experience from myself and I did mm -hmm. fetal tissue back in Europe and in the US, we never really engaged in that too much. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So, I'm just move to the next slide here. Oh, you know, I would like to just talk through some of these sure. points here on this slide because you raised a really good point about the U.S. situation. As we know, fetal tissue from elective abortions is necessary for at least, uh, you know, some aspects of this work. And we're talking about six to ten weeks post-conception here. Um, typically, in the case of fetal tissue procurement, the standard uh, best practices, both ethically and medically, would be to um, 
gather the, discard, the tissue before discarding as medical waste. And what you normally want to do is get permission from the woman who's getting the elective abortion prior to her, you know, or separate from her decision to have an abortion, her decision to donate the materials for research purposes. Um, so really the third point is crucial. The decision for the elective abortion has to be independent of the permission to use that tissue for medical research. You want to keep those two consents completely separate and to follow up once the decision has been made to terminate a pregnancy, then you would go in and ask for the uh, tissue instead of discarding the tissue. Uh, there shouldn't be any changes to the abortion procedure. There should be no financial gain or access to abortion that's linked to that decision to provide for research. Now, the no changes to abortion procedure is a little bit tricky, as we'll see later on today. But uh, just in summary, we have three broad sets of challenges. We have the political and the religious challenges, obviously, about right the debate about abortion. This is really a hot topic right now with the uh, confirmation hearings happening on the Supreme Court and, and other uh, NIH funding uh, policies that have just arrived for fetal tissue research. Um, so we're not going to get into the issues of when life starts and the moral status of the fetus, but we do know, obviously, that the religious and political dimensions are very large here. But two other equally important issues are scientific challenges. Um, as Lawrence will talk a little bit further, um, we need several embryos or fetal tissue samples to cobble together to treat a single patient, which means you have to coordinate the timing of these abortions or the collections at least relatively close together to get that sample for transplantation. This is all in the case of using fetal tissue, of course. Um, so, you know, again, there is a need for intact tissue. You might have to have ultrasound guided abortion. Um, and, you know, there's a looming fact that there's an increase in drug induced abortions at home chemical abortions at home, which um, again, you know, is outside the, uh, the clinical setting. Um, and uh, so that's an additional challenge scientifically to gather that material. And then finally, you have challenges to the patient. Uh, in the transuro study that maybe Lawrence will touch upon, uh, many patients actually had to stand by, they had to wait to get enough tissue in a sufficient amount for the transplantation. So yet another challenge, not just scientifically, but also from the patient's perspective. And with that, I'm going to just turn it right back to Lorenz. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, so, so again, what, what I focus on is just a little bit kind of from a stem cell perspective, you know, what did we really learn from those studies? And so what's clearly important from the studies that were done, including so-called placebo controlled studies, again, an interesting topic we're going to discuss further, is that this therapy doesn't work routinely very well. No, it's very challenging to get it to work with fetal tissue because as Enzo mentioned, we need a lot of tissue. We need to know exactly how to inject it. And this was actually done at the very early stage. It's actually interesting to know that some of those uh, controlled studies that were done, placebo controlled studies, were, 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 had also nearly to do with the political debate at the time. That was when Clinton came to power and the idea was fetal tissue would now become available after Bush. And, uh, and Reagan before and would now basically cure many diseases and they very quickly rushed out money that would allow to do controlled, placebo controlled clinical trials and maybe prematurely so and actually caused again some issues that, that set the field back to some extent. But we still learned quite a lot from this whole experience and again what we particularly learned from when we look at the many patients that got these grafts is we know kind of which patients might respond better. That is one important point. And we have certain criteria, for example, that they still have certain what's called L-DOPA responsiveness and so forth, and that they don't have uh, certain side effects of the drug already, it's called dyskinesia, because that's something that has been seen in some of the patients that got fetal cells that actually got those uh, side effects. The other important thing we learned is that the, the design of the trial is very important, very different than what you would do for a drug, because this is a living drug and it actually matures. So it takes not only one year, which we thought at the time, but probably two to three years because before they could become fully functional. And that seems to actually play out if you go back and look at the patient's progression. We also kind of made important points about immunosuppression because in some cases, immunosuppression was used. In others, it was not used, but it's still not fully resolved within the brain what really needs to be done. And that's something, again, we'll come back to a little bit. And then the other thing we learned is that the grafting doesn't really affect other aspects of the disease, which I refer to it as LB, which means Lewy body disease. So Parkinson's disease makes also this, these alpha synuclein aggregates, which again can be seen and actually are part of the disease and they can spread to other parts of the brain. 
very late stages, for example, they cause cognitive problems, need a little bit like in Alzheimer's disease, even though they are different aggregates. But unfortunately, in some of those patients, even the patients that did really well, that didn't need any drug treatment, some of them, that part of the disease continued. And so that again suggests that if you maybe can clinically or from the genetics predict that the patient is more prone to get this Lewy body component of the disease, but less the movement disease, that might be not the ideal patient. So again, we learn quite a bit from those fetal studies on how to do that. But what we also learned is not really terribly practically feasible. We have today now something between a million patients in the US, for at least 10 million patients worldwide. And so that's not going to be ever a therapy that can be used broadly. So we need an off-the-shelf source. And here, just what I wanted to point to before I forget is that, again, another interesting part from the studies, because they were done, some of them in the 80s, 90s, we had really long-term data. So we know now that such cells can survive literally for 24 years and still make this brown dopaminergic marker uh, pigment after such, such a long time. And so that's, again, evidence that might be really a one-time treatment if you do it right. So what can stem cells then do in this context? So the idea is very similar. You want to replace lost function, but in a reproducible and scalable manner now, not just having to cobble together enough tissue, and patients having to wait and set back until we have enough, but we want to be ready and have it like a drug product ready to go. We hope that the stem cells can actually hook up in the brain, and we have good evidence for that. So they will probably do more than dopamine and actually integrate in the circuit and maybe stave off some of the progressive loss of circuit function. We think they will provide long-term benefit with a one-time surgery. And also interestingly, obviously that's more a, a commercial issue now, but they could be cost-effective because if you can make a lot of cells and we can already now make a lot of cells at a reasonable cost, the actual cost of the product is really not the cost of the goods, it's the cost of the treatment itself. But at least we are not really having this uh, very expensive situation where already the cost of the goods is very, very high. Uh, just very, very quickly, and I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but for me, that was really kind of a whole personal journey also how to get to that stem cell source. So again, I was involved in some of those fetal trial studies, and you can see how long that is because I have embarrassing haircuts and sweaters here. But so, so we did actually clinical trial also in Switzerland, again, and got me a lot of experience how to go from an ID all the way to a clinical trial. And I searched for many years, now what would be the right cell source? Pre-embryonic stem cells, we tried to isolate stem cells from the brain and tell them how to proliferate and become dopamine cells, which by the way, I also met my wife at the same time. And that's somewhat interesting because she's actually also gonna be the surgeon performing now the study, hopefully this in the next coming months. And finally, again, moving to New York, because I got converted from neural stem cells to embryonic stem cells. We tried everything. We tried so-called nuclear transfer stem cells. Think of Dolly the sheep, but in the mouse. We did partner genetic stem cells, and then various versions of embryonic stem cells, iPS cells. And it worked remarkably well at the beginning of my career. We had very nice papers. Mouse cells were, were working beautifully. But the story was not so easy, it turns out, because Yes, we published some similar work with human cells initially. So these are just some markers that show us the cells are functional, they seem to have dopamine markers. But the big surprise was when we put the human cells into mouse brain, they actually didn't survive very well. And in some cases, they caused overgrowth. So at this early stage, there was kind of a lot of work that needed to be done. And eventually we figured out how to do it better, but it took us again, at least about a decade to get there. And we came up with protocols they can now make these pluripotent stem cells, IPS or ES, very precise into neural tissue. It's just two precise molecules. They all become neural cells. And then from there, you can specify which neural cell type you make until you end up, for example, with a dopamine nerve cell. So it became much more predictable, not just trial and error, but real basing it on developmental cues and understanding those cues. And this allows us today now to make actually most cells of the human body. So you can actually think this, what I'm talking to you about Parkinson's disease, you can easily plop it and copy it for other diseases where you need to replace cell types, whether it's in the heart, whether it's in the peripheral nervous system. It's a very, very similar situation. So really the breakthrough paper for us was in 2011. So again, about a decade ago already, but where we could show that we can make those dopamine nerve cells. We can inject them into Parkinson's model in the mouse, in the rat or in a monkey. In all cases, the cells seem to survive very well, and they restore some of those classic behavioral deficits. 
what I'm showing you is just one of those rats. And if I start to move, you will see that the rat is not really moving properly the left paw. It basically moves it along uh, the, the table. It cannot really properly, what's called initiate movement. After the treatment, you see it starts initiating movement. So it's a little bit more sophisticated than just say it doesn't move at all. It's not paralyzed. It's similar to a Parkinson's patient that stands at the red light. The light turns green. What you can see is actually they cannot properly initiate movement. They step and then suddenly they make a bunch of steps together. And so this is the equivalent in, in the rat model that we can nicely recover. We also showed that we really know how these cells work. It's not just we put them in and then we pray it works, but we actually know mechanistically how it works because we can put them in genetically engineered so that we can now take a light source, shine them into the brain. And it's called a technique called optogenetics. And you can now literally switch on, switch off just the cells you graft. So the animal recovers, I showed you the movie on the left. But if you then switch off the cells, the animal is again fully sick. If you then switch off the light, the animal works again. So what that shows you, it's not just a complicated way, maybe affecting the host or regeneration, it's actual function of the cell. And they are properly hooking up and that could spend many, many minutes or hours talking about that this year. So I'm very excited about, in this case, that we really have a good understanding of how it works. But again, understanding is one thing, can we actually eventually translate it? And that comes to the next question, how you do that as an academic lab and where can you find the resources to do that? And what's the best model to actually move that forward? And so we were fortunate at the time that there were these state initiatives, such as in New York, there was so-called NYSTEM initiative that allowed uh, like three or four projects to move from the bench to the bedside. And so you see some of the steps now that we had from planning, how do you take now this protocol we published into something that's highly standardized that we could submit then a protocol to the FDA that they think this is a proper way to make those cells, no serum, animal products and so forth. Can we make them in the right numbers? Because we want to treat many patients in the future not just the goal, the proof of concept in this one patient and start all over. From the beginning, we wanted to have an off the shelf approach. Then the other way, can you do that reproducibly? What do you do if it's again, think of a drug, uh, drug formulation, can you make it with similar precision and so forth? And then how do you actually design a clinical trial? As you can see, we were pretty optimistic with the timeline at the time, because by now we should have already two or three years of clinical experience. Unfortunately, that's not the case. But as I talk to my colleagues, we are not completely alone in that. That things usually take a little bit longer and we are learning what really is truly needed. So the first step really was the question, what is the right cell to move forward? And this was a decision we had to make quite early. We had this funding, we had to make a decision. And in hindsight, I'm not sure whether it's absolutely the best decision six years later, but that, that's the decision we made. We chose to take an embryonic stem cell. If you remember, we have embryonic IVF derived, we have IPS-derived cells. And uh, basically we used that because again, there was manufacturing was already kind of known how to do that. We partnered with uh, Y-Cell, which is the company started with, or an organization started with Jamie Thompson who first isolated those cells. And we could relatively easily make large numbers of those cells and do all the testing, for example, pathogens that is needed to make sure that the cell line should be safe. But I was particularly excited because we need to make sure that these cells are genetically stable. We don't want to have a risk of tumors and so forth. That we had already data from the provider that they took the exact same cells, literally the same vials, and they grew them for another 50 passages and shown that they were genomically normal. So they had seemingly a pretty good starting point. And so we had made this decision. But again, here we can maybe go a little bit slower. And again, it's like, so, so what is really the pros and cons now of doing that. So on the one hand, what for us was important, you know, we had the grant, we needed to go, ready to go was important. We knew these cells can differentiate and that's probably also good for the patient. We don't want to have surprises in the differentiation potential. But what it came as a drawback is these cells were never designed to be used clinically. They were, this, they were derived by Jamie Thompson many, many years ago, I think it's 1998. And actually he personally told me he specifically had certain time when he derived his cells, but he didn't perfectly keep track so that they will never be used in human patients. That was his idea. Now, obviously that didn't work perfectly and they were also on mouse feeders and so forth. But actually what was done, including by his own uh, effort and later on, is that they were re 
kind of specified. So all the vital pathogens you might be worried of, all the genetic testing, all of that was tested and they were re-qualified as potentially clinically suitable. There are also interesting things, we can discuss that in more detail in the discussion. There are specific FDA rules that are actually quite tricky, if not impossible to fulfill with embryonic stem cells. One of them is called donor eligibility uh, status or criteria, which was a rule put into place in 2005 that basically wants to protect the patient from, again, pathogens. So the idea is if you get certain tissues that are soon after injected in the individual, you really want to know that the donor was healthy, had no HIV, no HC, no hepatitis, and so forth, a whole set of testing that needs to be done very close to the time the tissue is donated. So that works pretty well. I think it's a very reasonable rule for that case. However, if you think how are embryonic stem cells made, embryonic stem cells made, nearly all of those lines were made from IVF embryo that were left over. So contemporaneous consent and testing is really not possible because they didn't really know at the time that many years later when they don't want to have additional children, they donate those leftover embryos, they didn't know that they would do that in the future. And so again, actually embryonic stem cells, it's very difficult to achieve that because you don't really want to already derive your stem cell line when it's donated because there's priority first to get the couple, the child that they so desire. And so that's clearly one, one issue there. But also for the scientists, it's, it's, it's actually quite tricky. So what currently the situation is that it was decided that for the cells derived before this rule, these rules just don't really apply. So they kind of are grandfathered in, but not grandfathered in for the actual product. So it looks like, like for us, we can move forward to an early stage clinical trial, seems to be fine. But we have this uncertainty hanging over our head. If we really want to have this treatment for thousands of people routinely, it's not clear that the FDA will actually approve that. And so that gives a lot of uncertainty that's still not completely resolved yet. Then again, there is obviously the, the ethical political debate. Inzu already mentioned that in the context of fetal tissue a little bit. And people often get confused, or the patients get confused what these cells exactly are. No, is this again fetal tissue I showed you previously, like in a fetal stage? But actually, it's IVF, no, it's just leftover embryos. What are the differences and so forth? We mentioned a little bit you now the concerns, particularly with the current government. There's always a looming scare that actually they might even ban embryonic stem cell work outright, at least for funding. But there's also, again, some patients just simply might not want to have that for their own, for their own ethical or religious reasons. We also had this issue quite concretely, you know, that actually certain companies, so I'm going too much into names, but it's pretty clear you know, that some companies, particularly in Europe, you know, they have issues with embryonic stem cells because in Germany and other countries, it's much more obvious that embryonic stem cells seem to be more difficult to, to be used in that case. They have different patenting laws because they consider it more like human life to be patented in this case. If it's an embryonic stem cell, that's a whole other debate. But so in this case, it's also just simply for a company to corporate image. There were actually some companies we talked about in the US, they really don't want to do that, not necessarily because they personally have a big problem, but they think that maybe the customer somewhere in the in a very religious state that buys at the same time their washing machine, you know, they see that they do this embryonic stem cell work and then they're gonna no longer buy their washing machine. So it, it's a complicated decision what's really the best product. And maybe with, uh, with IPS cells, which are derived by reprogramming from adult cells, that's much preferable for some of them. On the other hand, there's also the scientific concerns that we have. There's the risk associated with IPS reprogramming. So if you get the cells from an embryo, they are in the perfect environment. They have been obviously going to the first days of development, nothing tricky there. If you make IPS as you put all these transcription factors, they get kind of reshuffled. The genome, epigenome gets reshuffled. There's a certain risk associated with that and the safety. Also, it's not clear that the stability is exactly the same. On the other hand, there's the issue of the immune response with IPS cells, you can literally make them from your own cells. I mentioned your own blood, your own urine cells. You could have matched cells, but then you can make the counter argument. If it's your own cells and you have Parkinson's, is that really a good idea? Because those cells might get Parkinson's right over again. So again, there are many pros and cons, and I don't think there's an absolute winner. And there are IPS and ESL programs moving forward today. So I'm just gonna go now back a little bit quicker again through some of the more technical things, which is actually how we then go from, actually how we, we develop a real product. And so one part, again, that's really technical is kind of how do you make the protocol work? 
And we thought, again, we are not the master. It took us 10 years to make human ear cells behave. We had a nature paper. Everything is great. We can just do that now with slightly better reagents so they're cleaner. But when we actually did that, it didn't work anymore, the protocol. So it took us another three, four years to kind of re-optimize that. And again, for the aficionados, at least here's some of the points we had to do doing the bottom, know that we had to switch certain media and so forth. But eventually we figured out again that we can do that even at higher efficiency, highly reproducible and so forth. So another issue we had to do is we want to have an off-the-shelf product. Off-the-shelf means can in our nature paper, we always make the cells fresh, inject them with the animal, we're happy, it recovers. But in this case, actually, you want to have a frozen product. So can you take nerve cells, freeze them down, and saw them, and they still function? So first, we wanted to just simply see, now, is that possible? Can we freeze them? And what you can see here, this is a viability plots that they, we can do. They're pretty good at the beginning, which is here, the zero hour time, uh, where we see pretty good vi viability after a frozen product. And even if you then leave that product for many, many hours or dies, still stable. Now, why is that important? That's important, again, from a regulatory perspective. You need to tell the regulatory, what's the shelf life time once you, make, once you prepare your sample? How quickly does the surgeon need to inject it? So it's very important that you know that. It's also very important that you know the shelf life time of the frozen product. So what you do is you make some cells that are made a little bit before the final clinical product like the cannery in the, the coal mine, you have them going ahead and make sure that they still test well after one year, two years, three years. And by now, we have something like up to four to five years where we have data showing the shelf lifetime of the frozen cells is also still very, very good. Then obviously, it's, it's one thing to say they look good by a viability assay, but can they still function in an animal model? So we then take those cells, inject them in this case into a Parkinsonian rat, and show that they make these very nice brown fibers that renovate the brain. And what you can see on, on the right side, you see this plot, which is a so-called rotation assay, where you induce Parkinson on one side of the animal's brain, the animal is asymmetric, it rotates, and it becomes symmetric if you then put cells back where the cells were lost, it goes back to zero. And indeed, the frozen cells can do that beautifully. So that gave us, again, many of the pieces now to say, okay, we have all the pieces of the puzzle together. So can we now do that? truly clinical, can we make the clinical batches the off-the-shelf product to use? And so we actually did that, and we did that already in 2016. So what that means, we made about 10 billion cells in this very fancy facility, it's called a GMP facility, where you basically had a number of rooms just dedicated for our product, and we made the equivalent, what we think is about 1,000 human doses. Now, we know it's never going to use 1,000 doses from that product, but you actually use most of the cells not for the patients, but for doing all the safety testing all over again with the same product that you want to use in the patient. So again, the cells are cryopreserved. And again, I have here three years, by now it's even five years. We have to, or close to five years with the precursor of the product. And again, we have to insert certain criteria you need to specify to say, okay, do I have the right cells in the, in the tube? That's very, very important. And again, the way you do that is you have to kind of pre-specify how your cells need to look. How, poor, how pure do they need to be? For example, here I have an example of one marker. It's called FOXA2, which is a marker quite specifically expressed in the midbrain cells and the midbrain dopamine cells. Otherwise, usually it's expressed in the liver in other regions, but in the brain, it's quite specific to just those cells. And you can see we have nearly every single cell being positive for that marker. Conversely, for safety, you need to make sure that none of the stem cells are left. And you might know that if you inject undifferentiated stem cells into a brain, you get a tumor called a teratoma. And so obviously that's something we absolutely want to avoid. You want to be sure we have not a single cell left. The problem is it's not so easy to prove that because it depends on the sensitivity of your assay. But so we developed three different assays. Here just shown one, which is a gene expression assay, where it's very small, maybe you cannot read it, but you can see here at the end, is actually the expression in a fibroblast. And this is a negative curve, so the higher you are, the less expression you have. So fibroblasts, which are skin cells, they should have none of those pretty potent cells. And you can see that our product is basically as low as, for example, fibroblasts. So we cannot detect any, any cells that are, in, that are left over. And so the way you can think about it more, again, all of you are familiar with the pharmacy, you now you get a drug a label with information. And so you kind of very similarly, you wanna have information. So how many of your FOXA2 cells out there, how many of maybe the wrong cells, PAC6 cells could be there, and what could be then 
try to understand now kind of how to formulate that we cannot do it as precise as a pharmaceutical drug. It's more a work in progress, but that's kind of the goal now that you have the same precision of formulating what you need in your, in your vial to actually hopefully help the patient. So now we have the cells, we have all this preclinical data early on. So what do we need now all over again? And how do we interact with the regulatory agencies? So there are usually multiple steps to interact. One is called this pre-pre-IND meeting, which is now renamed as the interact meeting, where you can ask very general questions. For example, for us, it was really the question, is it okay to use this cell line or what, what needs to be done to use this cell line? What kind of testing and so forth? And so we had that already in 2014 and then 2016, another meeting, which really then focused more on the way we make the cells, what kind of media, what kind of factors are the cells exposed, what kind of animal models are we going to propose to test the cells again and so forth. And that went pretty well. And then the feedback we get is that they were particularly, obviously, a little bit more information we knew on the final what's called definitive testing. So we have now a product, now we have billions of cells, so let's take those cells and do all the safety and efficacy again. So we know product that's going into the patient's brain was fully, fully tested. They wanted to have also some more device testing, meaning the actual device we put into the patient is obviously not a device you can test in a mouse or in a rat. And so that required actually some limited monkey studies uh, again. Again, these are some of the studies you have to do, so-called GLP studies. So you can not just do them routinely in your lab, you need to do it with a specialized contract research organization, a CRO. The classic ones are tumor genicity, by distribution toxicology. Many of them obviously kind of make sense, even though some of them are really more designed for a drug. For example, again, you could argue, is it really as essential to look for liver toxicology, you know, if you put yourselves into, into the brain and if they don't get away and so forth. But again, you need to go through all the different rigmarole that you would go also for, for any other product. And then we also had to do a whole complete efficacy study. And if you can see the numbers, obviously, this is a very, very extensive effort that you have to do, very expensive studies that you don't really hopefully have to do too many times. Again, to just give you a little bit of a flavor, again, we don't need to go into details, but what you could show is, for example, again, that the cells really don't really move around much. So where we inject them, that's where they stay. And you can do that with very sensitive assays where you look for human genome copies. And you can see that in most regions, you can absolutely detect nothing, that's just noise. And at the very early stage, maybe some cells travel through the ventricular area or not, but afterwards you basically find nothing in different brain regions or so forth. And so therefore, by distribution is really restricted to where you inject the cells. Equally important is a tumor genesis study. And there's again, a lot of interesting debates now how you best do that and what's the goal of that study. Kind of classically, it was the idea of the rem remaining stem cells. Even so, as I just told you, we think we have not a single stem cell left. You kind of have to prove that functionally. And one way you can prove it is by, on one hand, injecting obviously completely tumorigenic cells and show that they form a tumor, which they did in our study, or that you put your cell product that obviously doesn't make tumors. But what they also wanted us to do is to actually spike in some of the stem cells. So either at in this case 0.1%, 0.01%, to show that even if we had some, that they still seem to not really form a tumor. And again, there's a lot of controversy where this is still really a good assay, because with modern techniques, I think we get much more sensitive than this in vivo assay ever can do. And furthermore, there's the issue you note know, that you can kind of change the condition. You can just put inject human stem cells, but the way they were maintained maybe makes them survive poorly. For example, there were studies from a company called Cheron, first company to make human embryonic stem cell-based transplantation spinal cord. They claimed that they could inject up to 5% pluripotent stem cells, never getting a tumor. So if we do that, we get massive teratomas because we treat the stem cells differently. So it's then really not a, a reliable assay that can be used for everyone. So that's how that looks. If you have a tumor, it looks like here on the left. If you have a nice graft, it looks like here on the right. If you look for efficacy, we found that we can replace this lost dopamine in this unilateral model. You see this is the graft that cells and they completely restore dopaminergic innervation in the animal. They completely restore this behavioral asymmetry, both in male and in female animals. And we get this very beautiful looking, very mature dopamine cells that look exactly like they would look 
in your midbrain when you are normal healthy individual. And we can get them actually in pretty large numbers. So in a rat, these are very large numbers. If you remember the numbers in humans, you have about three to 400,000. The rat is much, much smaller than just three or four times smaller. So, so we could get really load up the, the, the rat with a lot of dopamine neurons. And again, the viability helps us then to understand what the potential goes in humans. That leads us now to the real discussion of, of, a, of the clinical trial. So, so how do we go about that? How do you design a clinical trial for something that's really kind of radically new and not a standard drug, something stays there forever? So you, I'm sure you know about the different phases of trial, phase one, phase two, phase three. And so in this case, obviously you have to start with the phase one, it's the first in human study, but you can call it phase 2a if you want, because we already have some pre-specified parameters where we look for some signs of efficacy. There's no way you can really get statistically meaningful data with such a small cohort, but you can see obviously signs maybe in the treatment group versus basically just a control cohort. So what we plan to do here is to use uh, basically 10 patients and we have certain uh, uh, inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. Some of them go back to what I told you about fetal tissue, where we learned where this therapy might be more suitable. We had to think about those levels, and we have now a lot of experience where we know how well these cells survive. Coming back to Inzu's point about comparing the fetal tissue, we know how many fetal cells survived in the patients that did well. And so that's, it looks like about 100,000 cells are needed to get a, a reasonable, at least a, a measurable effect. And so that's for us actually the guidance for our low dose. Now we also want to have a higher dose, which would be more to a complete replacement if you assume there's a one-to-one -one function. The other issue is, can you actually do that in a bilateral fashion? Because usually the patients have problems on either disease, but if you do surgery into the brain, then obviously you might cause, have a certain risk for each injection that you do. We're gonna make basically three tracts into the brain on each side of the brain to target uh, the, what's called the putamen. And what you can see on the right side is actually an intraoperative MRI system where you can not only inject very precisely into the brain, but you can do that under image guidance. So you can see exactly where the cells are. In this case, it's a drug, not the cells, but it's the same region. And you can more importantly show that you don't cause any bleeding. So you can be pretty confident there's no major bleeding and therefore you can move to the other side. And these were again, very important discussions we had with regulatory agencies because traditionally they are very hesitant to allow you to do a bilateral procedure for a new, for a new study, because for obvious reasons, if something goes wrong. But in this case, that there was at least seems to be that they allow us to move forward with a bilateral procedure. Another important point is now, how can you in such an early study already have some evidence now to have the right patients and how do you select those patients? If you don't have the approval for the study, you cannot really recruit patients for the study. On the other hand, you really would like to have a good understanding of the progression of the disease. Because in some cases, Parkinson's disease can progress quite quickly. In some cases, it's much more slowly and that might impact how, you know, how to select the patients, how to compare them. So something we did, by we, I mean Claire Henchcliffe was our neurologist in the study, developed a study that's independent, patients consent to an observational study without any promises to be part of any new experimental therapy, but they basically have an observation study where they get a lot of the tests that later on we would like to use in the patients, and therefore we get a very good baseline. And the idea was that you can recruit from those patients in the future. You have obviously to get consent for the actual procedure. In our case, the procedure to inject those embryonic stem cell derived dopamine neurons. But it's also nice because then the other patients that are kind of matched, you can try to have matched cohorts and see if they get another, or if they get no other intervention, you have kind of a no intervention group with enough follow-up. Lorenz, uh, when uh, people enroll in this trial, do they not get other standard treatments or interventions? So they get uh, basically the best available clinical care. Again, I didn't go much into, into that in the issue with regard to when, when is this therapy most efficacious? And again, there's even some interesting discussion there, but usually it's when the standard care doesn't work very well anymore. So they take the levodopa for the first five years, it works pretty well, but then it doesn't work very well. It starts to wear off. They start getting symptoms at different parts of the face and they kind of need something else. They could go to DBS, they could go to something else. And so, so that's kind of the, 
the fact that we try to keep the patients in the best possible group. Now, obviously, in our study, for now at least, if they then go to DBS, then they could no longer serve us as, 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 uh, as a competitor. They can serve as a competitor in our study, but they can no longer enroll in our study. In the future, that's a whole other discussion. It's actually not a contraindication. You could have potentially both treatments because they don't really treat exactly the same thing. But initially, it just makes it too complicated, and therefore, that would be a different approach. But they get basically the best, best available care at that stage. And it's actually a good point because one thing that happened in such designs is that sometimes when then the patients need something else, so they could need our team, they could need something else, then if our red therapy is not ready and we got a bit delayed, they go to get something else, then the patient you still have, they didn't get to that stage. And maybe they actually are selected for the patient to have a slower course of the disease. So it might actually potentially skew a little bit overall population. So there are interesting discussions on how good that model really works. But that's what they decided to do. And it also will allow us to move more quickly to actually have patients ready, assuming that some of those patients seem interested in this approach. They would have already some of the imaging, some of the testing done. So we don't have to start from the beginning. Now, if you think about clinical trial design, there are also some interesting points that come up there with regard to conflict of interest and regulations. And so one issue that we came up is now the issue, who should really be the PI on some of those trials? And I come back, I should have had my conflict of interest slide one earlier, but I mean, we've started with a company called Blue Rock Therapeutics and it's got bought by Bayer and so forth. And my wife is also co-founder of this effort as a neurosurgeon and has developed all the animal data. So obviously very qualified, knows exactly how to do it and has all the expertise, but she cannot really be a PI on this project because she would have a conflict of interest. But then you have to train someone else who basically doesn't have the same skills in doing it. They have to be completely coming from new, they don't understand the cells very well. And so there's interesting conflicts that happen. And the question is, can it then maybe not be the PI, but still do some surgery? And so these are very interesting discussions that we had with some of the, the oversight boards. Another point is that the regulations know if you design such trials or even the cell product itself are actually not consistent across different regulatory agencies. So the hope is no, you, in the future, in a couple of years, now you're going to have regular BLA, FDA approval, you have a product. But the question is, is it going to be approvable in all the other agencies if they have different rules about whether cells can have seen certain reagents or not, whether there's a placebo controlled trial that needs to be done and so forth. And these are again issues which are interesting to discuss and we can discuss further, but I don't have a good answer. But we've definitely came across that talking to different regulatory agencies, you get actually quite different responses. Lawrence, real quickly, do you think that could lead to patients traveling to other locales where it is approved? Sure, I mean, that is one thing. And uh, we get obviously then another issue that uh, th th there's the whole issue of stem cell tourism. You now there are other cell, stem cell products that are basically done in places that are out of certain regulation, regulatory landscapes where people go to get certain treatments that are different than this. But even for this kind of treatments, it's possible that some people actually I get contact you know, from people all over the world that would want to have our treatment if it's not ready in another place. I know some companies that, that basically then transfer their trial to different countries because they think they have a more beneficial regulatory landscape. And so it's definitely an, an issue that you can kind of try to play the game a little bit to your benefit. So again, one point that also came up in Parkinson's uh, here, we definitely can discuss in much more detail if there's interest, is the issue of surgical placebo. So everyone knows about placebo in drug trial, but what about surgery? Where you inject cells into the brain, how do you do a placebo? And so that actually was done in those, some of those trials. The way it was done is that the patients actually went, they got randomized, they got basically a burr hole in the brain, they went into anesthesia. And if you understand correctly, I didn't do the trials, but they even got immunosuppression, which I think again, you can argue is that ethically an acceptable approach. The pros is saying, if you don't do that, you never know that it works. And I have that example of people did before even fetal tissue grafts, they did something called adrenal graft. You take your adrenal gland, which has hormone producing cells, but when injected in the brain, they make dopamine like cells. It actually never really worked, the cells never really survived, but because it was never really properly controlled, surgeons started doing it, patients had of side effects, and it only got stopped after many, many years because there was no clear, clear control. 
And again, in some countries, it might be required for regulatory approval. And it's true that in Parkinson's disease, depending on the study you look, some studies had a huge placebo effect in placebo control. There was a study with porcine grafts done by Diacrina company actually in Boston that had about 20% improvement in the placebo and around 20% improvement in the porcine <laughs> grafts. And so obviously it was not significant. And so, so you can say it's really important. It also was important maybe to detect the side effects, which are this graft induced dyskinesia, which were never really reported in the open label studies. So maybe it needed that control and um, to really know that it's more than just what you see in a normal Parkinson's patient. I mentioned already some of the cons. Clearly we can discuss more. No, is it ethical if the patient has no chance of benefit, but the significant, I think it's in my opinion, more than a minimal risk in this case, is that acceptable to do? And then again, it also prevents them often from participating in trials that, that might actually give them a new therapeutic window, maybe gene therapy trials, DBS and so forth. And the other argument that's made often by Roger Parker, who runs the TransEuro trial, now, if you really need that placebo trial, maybe it's not even worth it <laughs> because you really want to see a massive effect. You want to see that they don't need Levodopa 10 years later. Now, that's not a good endpoint for a clinical trial, but there's no doubt no, that it worked in those specific individuals. And also, if it's used prematurely, it can actually set the field back. And I just put here this one. I dug out the New York Times front page, it was actually at the time, when the placebo trial placebo control trials came out, Gina Colada wrote this piece on the front page of New York Times saying that really it was, was a real setback and there were even all the quotes that are much, much harsher than that from, from a cure to disaster or something like that. And what really happened is now that these trials were poorly designed, they had weird endpoints and so forth, but because they were placebo controlled, they really set back the field for many, many years because it was now proven it doesn't work. But, but so again, so there are, these are some of the pros and cons of thinking about that. I think they might have a place, but they would have to be done in, in a reasonable way. And they would have to be done with, with tr truly minimal risk. And the, it would have to be at the stage when we really already have very good evidence now that this works and with the minimal number of, of patients needed. But again, that's something we can discuss further. And there are alternative approaches as well. Now, just quickly, now the way we tried to approach that for all these various issues, we started a consortium, a global consortium. That's not only my group in the US, there are other groups in the US that are a part of it, Europe, Japan. And we come regularly together at least once a year where we decide some of those points, regulatory landscape. We, for example, put out the piece in cell stem cell on clinical trial design where we put out how maybe to make a better clinical trial design and really try to be, even though we are you could call us competitors. Many of them actually have now started their own companies. We still try to have the academic spirit of also be collaborators because we think we are all in the same boat to make that really hopefully eventually a new treatment that really can change, change the situation in Parkinson's disease. And so, and so just maybe a few comments on that. There is issue that actually kind of things have started. Now there are at least two groups that are part of our consortium now. One is uh, uh, Jun Takashi has been part of that for a long time. They actually have started one patient to be grafted now with IPS derived dopamine neurons. And so they want to have seven trials, uh, seven patients in this initial group. It's government and company funders, an interesting tidbit there. Now they actually start a company too, but then Shin Yamanaka and others got worried and they tried to actually have the trial government funded. So there's less pressure of commercial interest for this because it's again, obviously the the big thing in Japan that is early key IPS trials go, go well and have no conflict of interest to the extent possible. But there was this very interesting study actually in the New England Journal of Medicine just this year from a patient, an N of one, that also got its own IPS derived dopamine neurons. And in this case, actually it was patient funded. It was a wealthy patient who had certain symptoms, seemed to be not particularly severe, but he basically funded the research and actually then funded his own treatment in this case. He got the exception from the FDA that this is not like a regular trial. It can be used on compassionate use and it moved forward. And again, that's again something we maybe we can discuss further, further what are some of the issues associated with that. They also had colleagues of mine know that really did that also quite early on. They had basically crowdfunding, they had patients that were not completely clean or they were really promised by funding to get their own treatment from that group but at least it gets very close to that area where you really need to think carefully how that's best done. And again, there are all these different models that I mentioned here a little bit, how this gets funded. In some cases, there is a, what's called the ISCO trial. That's not really dopamine neuron, 
uh, from 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 um, ES or IPS cells. They come from a so-called partner genetic cell. They actually put up very early progenitors, not specified. Don't have time to go into details, but this is like a very shaky company, and they really try to raise the, the profile by a lot of publicity and try to push very hard and have patients travel there. So, so there's all kind of models where really companies that try to make the clinical trial to even survive to then big players, like what we try to do with Bayer or in Sweden with Novo Nordisk that are part of it, to then government paid like Syra to really move forward with that. Not interesting feature that really comes up in those trial designs is that actually you have kind of a policy that you need to say how you're going to communicate about that. Now you don't want to give undue hope, you don't want to have kind of a messy communication. But again, talking to Roger Parker, which I know very well, the trans-euro trial was a huge problem and also in other trials and in the age of social media that just doesn't work anymore. So the patients just say, hey, I had this nice treatment and I feel so much better and send it to I don't know how many people. And even though you discourage them, it's extremely difficult con to control to have proper and appropriate communication. And what we really try to do, we work with patient groups, we have patient advocates that are very well trained about the pros and cons of the treatment. They go out to the community, tell the patients what really to expect. But again, it's something very difficult uh, actually to control. Just again, so in our effort and kind of where are we now in the overall timeline, uh, about 10 years again to get to the Nature paper, and now pretty much another 10 years to basically starting our clinical trial. And so it's a very, very long road. And again, here also my disclosures. So in 2016, we started Plurox Therapeutics because again, the nice time started to run out the state for sponsor and we knew we needed significant funding to make that a real clinical product. And so, so the question is kind of why did it take longer than expected? So some of the things is that again, we're getting feedback from regulatory agencies. And I think it's a tricky thing because it's really kind of a different paradigm in this case. It's because we try to have an off-the-shelf product. It's not just a one-off thing. We want to have something that really can move forward. And it's a kind of a permanent implantation of a nerve cell product. So how is that going to be regulated? We know very well no cell product, but can you be sure that this is really every single cell exactly the nerve cell you want to have in vivo? We think we can at least characterize like 98 or 99 percent of the cells of those neurons, but there might be a few cells that are not. They're probably perfectly healthy, normal glial cells and so forth. But there's a lot of thought that goes into how do you specify that that's really safe. So we did a lot of additional work to really convince everyone that this is safe. And then also the patient group, what's the best risk benefit? Is again, something maybe we should discuss further in the discussion. And again, typically the FDA is very conservative. They want you to go to the most severe patients for the first in human study. But those patients have also the least chance to benefit from it. And they might have other features in late stage that makes them much more prone to have side effects from the treatment as well, surgical and so forth. So it's a very tricky thing. And again, something we are going through very quickly. And we are, uh, we are indeed, literally at the verge of actually uh, go, getting hopefully the final word so that we hope we can start either by December or January of this year to actually start with our first, first patients. So it's a very timely presentation because we think we finally are at the stage to actually implement all of that. Now just maybe two, three minutes about the, the future because again, one thing is to make that early product, it's already off the shelf, but if you actually want to make a commercial grade product, that can be used for very large number of patients. You need to, again, go several logs up in the production capacity, and you need to have something which is called in vitro potency. You cannot always go back to a mouse and do a nine month study and see that it works. You need to be able to predict from the cells themselves, are they potent or not? And that's actually a difficult job. Then the other thing is that we think we still give the patients immunosuppression at this stage for at least one year. And I told you there's a bit of a controversy about to what extent that's needed. But we had several panel of immunologists, ethicists, clinicians, and so forth. And the consensus was to give the, the initial graph to get the most information and the relatively limited risk for short-term immunosuppression. So the best way to go for 12 months with immunosuppression. But that has certain, certain risks to the patient. And the future for the complete off-the-shelf product could be a cell that's no longer immunogenic at all. They can be engineered such. And we've already done that, at least scientifically. And so that leads, and again, to the point, so what would you do beyond phase one? And so one interesting regulatory issue there is that for these medicines, there has been kind of a, 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 a situation where you can get what's called ARMA designation, which is the regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation, early on after a phase one study. 
So phase one study has some evidence, not exactly defined what it means. It's the idea of the breakthrough without really defining what the breakthrough exactly means. You can get this RMAT designation that allows you more quickly to go a phase two study, and phase two, two B study in this case, with maybe 60, 70, 80 patients. And that study could be enough to get you a biological license application approval for actual broader commercial use. So you would not have to go to full blown phase three study before you could sell it as a product. That's his RMAT designation. That's exciting, it might make things go faster, but obviously it has also risks uh, in certain ways, which again, we can discuss further. But it also brings the point that you have then to be ready for such stuff and you have to be ready for a commercial grade uh, type product. And again, we get then to the question for this kind of studies, what control groups are needed? What do you compare it against? Some people get DBS, is that a good control group? How do you perform a complex multicenter study with, with such patients? What's the number of patients? Can you implement new designs instead of placebo? So something is called adaptive trial design, which has been mostly used in cancer therapies for testing multiple drugs, multiple doses, very quickly within one trial. You basically pre-specify a scheme where you don't just conduct the trial, but during the conducting, you have pre-specified points where you review you. And then you're allowed to adapt it if you have pre-specified the possible adaptation. So it makes it statistically much more complex, but has been very successful in certain areas to really get the therapy much more quickly. Because if you think here, if you need to wait, I had the data there, one year is not enough. You might need two to three years before you know it works. You cannot do three, four trials, one after the other before you get there. So we need to be creative in, in the trial design. And again, I'm not gonna spend much time about that, but again, our vision, again, that's my personal vision, but also the vision of, of Blue Rock is that we actually would like to develop universal cell technology as a true off the shelf, as a true off the shelf product. And again, this is just a final future looking slide. The point that I'm trying to make here is my lab hasn't really stopped working on the basic side on dopamine neurons. The protocol, the GMP protocol was established set in stone, made an SOP in 2015. But five years later, we know actually more. We probably can make a better product. So why do we need to give the patient a worse product than the better product? And so how, how can you bring that back in? Or do you need to go all the way back and then do all the trials again? So that's the idea. Can you do basically comparability studies that are acceptable if they meet all the release criteria we defined? Is it okay to go with those lines? And again, I'm happy to discuss some of those points later, later as well. So just as a summary, I think what I tried to tell you is kind of a story how we got there to show that cell transportation could present a novel therapeutic option for PD, that we can now definitely technically make those cells at high efficiency. We can rescue various animal models. We can make them off the shelf. We have clinical trial design. And again, the trial now is, is literally imminent. And we have many ideas for the future there. And we think again that what we've learned here, we have access to many other cell types. I'm happy to chat about that another time now. We have many other uh, diseases that we think could be addressed and each of them with its own uh, benefits and, and challenges. And I just last here, I have some of the key people from the lab. I'm not gonna go through it, but just mentioning here, the consortia, the NYSTEM consortia that was really critical here. And obviously now working with Plurock to really getting that to the clinic. And here in highlight some of the the postdocs and students that have maybe contributed the most to our dopamine uh, project. I'm going to stop here and hope again we can have an interesting discussion. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Uh, while we're getting the questions sorted out for uh, the discussion, I just have two quick questions for you. Uh, one is, your approach does not address the non-dopamine symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Do you think that's a big limitation to your approach? I think so. I mean, I had actually that listed here. I rushed through it a little bit. So there's the non-dopamine symptoms, there are various non-dopamine symptoms. And the problem in a way is that with a cell-based approach, you, it's kind of the Lego piece. Now you can make multiple Legos. <laughs> For example, we have very good techniques to make enteric nervous system. So these patients can have very severe constipation that can dramatically improve, basically reduce the quality of life. For a completely different application, we develop enteric nervous system transplantation paradigms. And you could imagine once that's ready in those severe diseases, it's very safe, you could add that on top. And so there are a few cases where you could imagine doing that. And, but for, for example, the Lewy body disease, no, I don't think that can be easily done in the cortex. But even there, there are cell-based approaches interesting too. Now you can combine cells with genes. You can change inflammation within the brain by introducing for microglial cells. 
So there are interesting ideas there that in a piece by piece manner, you can try to treat that. But on the other hand, I mean, also excited and we're using stem cells a lot now to understand what the disease is all about. <laughs> my iPhone analogy, we're still interested why the iPhone breaks. No? And so, so we actually use stem cells very intensely for that. And so ideally what you would have is you would find something that really mechanistically slows down the disease at the stage where you can replace the cells that are already lost. And that would be probably the, the ideal situation. Yeah, real quickly, why, why don't the uh, transferred cells uh, also become lost through the disease process? I mean, originally the patient lost their dopamine neurons, and so why wouldn't the replacements also be lost? Yeah, it's an interesting point, and it's indeed the case that they largely do not get lost. I showed the 24-year-old graph. It's 90% it's true, so it turns out that you get some, in some cases, actually some signs of disease in the cells after 10 to 15 years. You can actually get some of those Lewy bodies in the graft, which is again very interesting mechanistically, because it suggests that this disease can spread. It's very unlikely that those cell lines have Parkinson's disease. So the disease probably spreads and leads us to the prior on hypothesis of Parkinson's disease. But the bigger picture to what you bring about is the interesting point that when you make embryonic stem cells or you reprogram IPS cells, those cells go all the way back to this five to six day old embryonic stage. When we graft the cells, they're probably the six to eight week old fetal-like dopamine neuron. And as you know, there's no Parkinson's patient that I know of that gets diseased when they are five years old or 10 years old. So for the five, 10 years old, they seem to go chronologically at that stage. And there's really cool data, you can actually look at that. You can, you get a pigment in dopamine neurons when they get old. So when you're very young, it's like the trees in a, with the rings in a tree, you get more and more pigment the older they get. And you've actually find if a patient dies, car accident, whatever, had a fetal graft, after one year it has no pigment. If the patient dies five years later, it has a little bit of pigment, <laughs> dies 20, it has more pigment. So they seem to age somewhat chronologically according to the age of the cell and not the age of the person that actually receives the graft. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, so I want to turn it over to our moderators and they can lead us through some of the questions that have come in. Um, we would happy to uh, have Lorenz address as many of those as possible. So why don't you hit us with the first few questions. Great, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. The work that you're doing sounds super intriguing and very promising, but as you uh, have articulated, it raises lots of practical and ethical issues and our audience have many questions. They're eager to hear your thoughts. So um, one of the first questions that we have is which potential side effects are you most concerned about as we move into human trials? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the most obvious one that came again from our experience with fetal studies is really the side effect of getting graft-induced dyskinesia. So what happened there in the fetal graft is that patients got kind of certain uncontrolled movements that is similar to what can happen if patients take too much of this levodopa. And so that's something which we think, we hope will not happen in our case. So the question is obviously, why did it happen in the fetal graft? <laughs> And the answer seems to be that it was likely not just the dopamine cells, but some other cell types within the grafted cells, which are called serotonin neurons, that can take up the same drug, the levodopa, but they don't release it properly, it's released in an unsyn unsynchronized manner. And so it was kind of recreated in some of those animal models. Fetal tissue has nearly as many serotonin than dopamine. In our case, we have nearly zero. So if that's the reason, then we should be fine. But is it really the reason? We, the, the trial is going to tell us. So clearly, I think that's something we need to look about is graft-induced dyskinesia. And then otherwise, it's difficult to say. I, I don't really have a, another very obvious concern. Obviously, we want to make sure that it's safe. Is any first in human study, you know, this, this remaining cells, you know, they're, they're, are they exactly the same as the fetal cells? I personally think there's no additional risk from what I see, but you can always make the argument you now with cells that have been grown in a dish. They're not plucked out of a fetus. What about 10, 15, 20 years later? And is that maybe it's not a problem because advanced Parkinson's patients that, that we want to treat, in average, sadly, the life expectancy of those patients is about 11 years. So maybe the super late problems are not going to be as much of an issue. But I think nobody can guarantee you know, that there's not a single genomic change in your cell that maybe many years later could cause a problem. Now, our cells are 99% neurons. <laughs> which is pretty good, but there's maybe a few other cells that are not neurons and maybe those would proliferate, they would do something. Again, I think it's very unlikely, but 
it's still something we have to worry about, definitely. And we have another question that's actually pretty similar um, in terms of clinical trials. Um, so this actually comes from Christine Mitchell. She's wondering, uh, I see you do not do large animal studies. Um, is this because of ethical concerns related to research on primates? And if so, can you say what, if anything, uh, was lost uh, by not testing injection on these cells by, uh, by primate brains? Um, and con conversely, if, what would be gained uh, by preclinical testing on primates? Yeah. So, I mean, I and she's wondering more so about the safety um, as well as clinical effectiveness. No, I think this is a very valid point. And that's something we actually we did do some primate studies. And we did them early on or in the initial publication but focusing mostly on kind of the scaling, because the primate brain is obviously much bigger than the mouse or the rat. So can it translate? Can they still reach the whole structure? So for that, it was very helpful for us to really see the anatomical integration of the cells. And the other area where we did use some primates, uh, primates uh, is in the context of the device. So we actually did test our final product in six, six monkeys together with the CRO. And we inject them with the exact same MRI guided injection device. We had actually the surgeon going to, to the CRO, doing the, doing the injection exactly there to make sure that it works smoothly, the cells survive. So I think for that, primates are still indispensable because they're the closest to what we can do to compare to the human brain. And even the frames that we use, the surgical frames, can be actually generated, uh, can, can be modeled exactly the same way. So that's very good. The reason why we didn't really do Kind of an efficacy or a large scale or long term study in the primates, which our colleagues in Japan did, Chun Takashi focused on that approach, so the different countries, different approaches. Is on the one hand, we, it was not required by the regulatory agencies, and the US is actually somewhere in between. In Europe, they, they nearly abhor, I mean, <laughs> they do very little of primate studies at all, so they actually did pretty much zero in, in their effort to move forward within our consortium. In the US, we did something in between. We did some for those criteria that I mentioned. In Japan, they did most of their kind of final studies in the primates. The problem we don't like to do much has not so much to do with ethical reasons even, so I think one has to be very mindful of that. If you, if you watch monkeys and their behavior, no, it, it, it's, it's eerie you know, how close they can be to our human behavior, and I think we have a special responsibility. But there is also the issue that exactly because of that, you cannot do the numbers that you would want to do. So if you talk about safety, you can do maybe five, six monkeys and you get approval and do that. But in, in the rat or in the mice, we did 400 of them. So if something happens that's really rare, something that happens kind of in a freakish way, you can capture it easier in some of those models. And similar to the behavior, the Parkinson's model in the monkey, it's a bit more shaky. You can make this what's called MPTP monkeys, but it goes over a long time, you inject these drugs, and sometimes the monkey spontaneously recovers. So it gives you more noise in the basal readout. And therefore, with that noise, you need even larger numbers to show good efficacy. And so these are some of the reasons why we didn't really push towards an efficacy study in the monkey, but only use them for like anatomical integration, injection device, something like that. We have a question about immunosuppression and using immunosuppression, how intense would the regime be and how risky might that be for a patient? Yeah, so we have a regimen that we kind of tuned down a little bit, so it's primarily tacrolimus, that's the, the main reaction against these uh, responses, and then we have a short, uh, a short treatment with, with steroids, relatively high dose, and then very low dose steroid maintenance up to a year. Initially, we had some other drugs as well, and so we, we basically reduced those because they seem to not make a big difference in the models we checked, but even that treatment can have clearly a risk, and there was again a big discussion about that. It's it's only happening for one year. So there's the, some of the common risk, you now if you have a kidney graft or liver graft, often these are long-term effects where you get toxicity in your kidney or in other cases. That I think is a, is a relatively low risk because again, it's short-term treatment. But still some patients will get complications. And there are statistics out that say for some of these immunosuppressive treatments, there's about a one year, 1%, sorry, a 1% risk of some malignancy that you have if you do one year of treatment with such immunosuppressive treatment. So if you get 10 years of treatment, maybe you have a chance, a 10% chance of getting some leukemia or something like that down the road. And so one definitely needs to be mindful of that. It also, 
requests a lot from the patient because you need to constantly check the drug levels so that it's safe and so forth. So it makes it much more difficult for the patient's life. Some of those patients are not terribly mobile. And so that's one of the reasons why we hope that eventually we have this universal technology where you don't even need to use that. On the other hand, there's again the interesting discussion There's Kurt Fried was again one of those PIs who did a fetal grafting trial. He did add, he added no immunosuppression to any of the fetal grafts. He still had many years later surviving dopamine neurons. Now, if you look at the numbers, it seems to be at three times lower. So it's again a little bit tricky. It's not like that cells seem to get rejected, but they probably survive worse if you don't give this one year of immunosuppression. That's why we chose it. But again, with the, with the risks that have to be balanced that I just mentioned it. So there's also another question, um, kind of looking into the ethical considerations regarding fetal tissue and embryonic stem cells, um, aside from religion and politics. So secular bioethics has not produced an ethical consensus regarding nascent human life. Um, the ethical debate centers around the tension between utilitarian and outcome-based ethical framework, and a, I'm sorry, and a framework that favors uh, Kant's categorical imperative that human life should not be used as a means to an end. So how do you and your colleagues balance these views? Lorenz, maybe I can take this one to begin with. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, sure. So, so these are valid concerns about secular bioethics and whether secular bioethics can really wrestle with deep questions about the meaning of early human life and the use of human life for scientific progress. I think in the case that Dr. Studer just presented to us, a lot of those issues are sort of not quite uh, uh, triggered or, or engaged because he's talking about cells that are prepared from uh, uh, adult cells that are transformed into stem cells and then differentiated down into dopamine neurons. So the line of work he's involved in and, and the cell product that he's testing and developing, it doesn't come from a fetal source and it doesn't come from an embryonic source. Uh, although the studies are informed, of course, by that kind of work. But this, this, this type of work, I think, could easily be supported by people who come from many different spectrums of beliefs about early human life and the morality of embryo some sort of research on abortion. So that's point number one. But I also think that it's also important for everybody to consider in secular bioethics that there is, whether you are, as the person referred to, a utilitarian or a Kantian, uh, that there is a deep commitment to wanting to reduce human suffering and to do the best you can for patients in great need, no matter what your religious or philosophical orientation is. So in light of those two comments, I think that um, you know, we, can, we can safely say that there is a place for those concerns uh, generally, but in the kind of research that Dr. Suter is doing, you know, I think that we need to really focus on the good that it can do for people in the future. I don't know if Lawrence, you want to add anything more to this theological or philosophical issue that's come up. I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, it has been used for a long time and I think again the fact that we can derive iPS cells has alleviated some of those concerns and again one could have a long discussion now with regard to embryonic stem cells or fetal cells what's what's the pros and cons and in case and how we had some of those in the slides now with regard to but it's a good thing to have yeah. tissues used but, for me, for medical use versus again right. versus versus uh, basically having them go to medical waste and so forth and for me, it's an interesting thing because I'm actually a raised Catholic. My, my mother uh, was teaching religion at school. So we had a lot of interesting discussions throughout my life. Now, what's really acceptable and what's not acceptable. But I think, again, the fact that we can now make such cells pretty much completely independently of any, having to isolate any tissue, I think that really kind of changed the game. It's really now more like a, a renewable source where we don't need ever any fresh tissue anymore. Now, so that's kind of the... The, the main point that that really changed changed the game, um, but but it's definitely a very interesting discussion and a valuable discussion. Again, I think Enzo, which the point I didn't make before, now with regard to the importance of fetal tissue, was important for us for the comparison for the dosing, but it still also remains very important in one important way, not necessarily as a therapy, like I mentioned. I don't think that's currently anyone wants to propose that, but as a comparator. So actually, when you get these cells, we have such fancy techniques molecular techniques and so forth, what's the gold standard? How do you know what you made in this dish with all these factors? How do you know you have the right cell? You always can go back scientifically see what they turn into, but if you can actually compare it side by side, is it the same that nature makes? 
can we, how close do we get? I think that's extremely valuable. For me, that's actually the most important use of remaining use of fetal tissue currently in my own work. We have um, another question and I'm cognizant of the time. So I want to quickly get uh, at least one or two more questions in. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the placebo control group um, and conducting what would effectively be a sham surgery and the ethical questions that come with that. Would you um, consider it more ethical if those patients were promised treatment with the uh, curing effects if they, they were shown to be curative down the road? Yeah, no, exactly. That is something that was done in some of those studies. And again, to make it more palatable for those patients. And the, the problem with that is a little bit that the disease, again, is a progressive disease. And they might still miss kind of the best window where it works, the best. And so, so, so I think that's for me still the issue. And we don't know exactly how long they have to wait. Like in the past for a drug trial, it's very easy. You know, you do six months this and then you flip the groups and you see where it works. But here it's a, it's a treatment that continues to grow. I just mentioned the point this insulin, you know, I put the cells in the brain. After one year, they look different than after two years and then after six years. So, so when do they have exactly the best benefit? And, and so, so it gets a little bit tricky when you actually would do the crossover and give the patients that didn't have it, give it later. But, but it's, it's a valuable thought. And I think that's something we definitely would consider if we are required to do placebo and you are, we just have to define now the hopefully a good endpoint. And, but you would definitely lose the long-term control if you do that now. That's the, for, for later time, but which kind of also scientifically a little bit <laughs> unfortunate. How are we for time? Maybe we, yeah, I was gonna say maybe I have one, uh, one more question and just looking towards um, how you can maybe use what you're studying now um, and apply it towards other things. So we had one attendee ask um, if you're looking to apply your studies into something like ALS or if you're solely focused on Parkinson's. No, we actually try to develop a number of different cell-based therapies. ALS is very difficult because again, it's, it's, it's a disease of a very specific population where at least the nerve cells, I think, cannot be easily replaced because it's such a complex way they have to grow back. And it happens throughout the body axis, not just the Lego piece, not there'll be hundreds of Lego pieces you have to put back. So it's very tough, but there are groups that are doing that with other cells that not really replace the cells, but they have like a chaperone, a protective effect that are injected from work by Clive Svensson and others, try to develop cell therapy. But I personally think ALS is maybe not the easiest one for this approach, but there are clearly other examples where this could be the case. For example, Huntington's disease is a classic example that might benefit from that, which is not a motor disorder that could work in a potentially similar manner. Or we have, again, certain childhood-related diseases. I mentioned in the enteric nervous system, which is in your gut, children with Hirschsprung disease. That's actually something we try to develop in actual trial currently. But we had also got a nature paper showing that this can work in a mouse. And we are trying to put that forward to the clinic in children, which is a whole other regulatory landscape, how you do something first time in a child, which usually have a different uh, regulatory landscape. So I think this approach will come about in various ways. And I think it will also change a little bit from this simple, maybe not so simple replacement idea, but actually combine it with gene therapy. So there's now quite a bit of success or promise at least in gene therapy. And at least we think that the combination could be even more powerful that you would put the cell back to replace, but you would also hopefully stave off further disease, or you can use the cells as a mule to deliver the therapy all over the, the body. So I think there are a lot of exciting areas where I think cell therapy will, will come about. And there's kind of an explosion now thinking about that. And Parkinson was an early example, but I think it's definitely not going to stop there. Well, with that, we are out of time. I would love to thank our audience members for joining us here today. This event was sponsored by the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. And I'd like to thank in particular Ashley Troutman, Angela Alberti, and Christina Larson. Uh, for, for their uh, help in this session today. Join us on November 20th for Organoids and COVID. Uh, I would like to then thank our speaker, Lorenz Studer, for joining us. And uh, thank you so much for your stimulating discussion and your presentation. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next month. Thanks so much.